Hello, welcome to another edition of It's All About the Dogs. I'm your host, George Quinlan, and today we have a guest coming to us from Skype from the United Kingdom. Um, Gwen Bailey and I have met many years ago, and she has moved on to do some remarkable things. I'm going to have to read because it's been a while since I've had a chance to um, uh, chat with Gwen. So, But I'll just tell you that, that uh, Gwen lectures nationally and internationally um, at conferences, and she's running training courses for animal shelters around the world. She's written 12 books, three of the books I have next to me. She's, they've sold 140,000 copies worldwide. And she's going on from that, uh, while she was doing all this, she's running a program called um, Puppy School. So let's find out more about Puppy School and the, the benefits of this. Hi, Gwen. I'm so happy that you're here with me. Hi, George. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, we've been talking about doing this for a long time. Um, it was, it, I didn't realize how long ago we met until I started preparing for this show because it's just been, I've always known you. It just seems like that, you know, we've, Never not known each other, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, I believe it was in 1996 that we met uh, in England. I was over there to um, give my first talk. Uh, well, the first, we, we, you, t you were a speaker as well. We spoke at the first APDT conference to create the organization, to see, yes. introduce it to dog trainers across the United Kingdom. We did it here in California as well, and it's taken off tremendously in both countries. Yes, so, it's amazing. It's amazing that we were at the beginning of all, all the behavior and new training methods. And yeah. it was a long time ago. It was 20 years, wasn't it? But it's, it shows how far we've progressed. Oh, really. absolutely. And it also makes you feel good to um, be a part of something, uh, even if on my end, even nobody knows who the heck I am. <laughs> <laughs> it yes, was, sure. but it's little drips in the big ocean, isn't it? It really is, and and it's carried over. Positivity. It's something that we believe in, and and we we live with it, and we share it all the time. And and if it never gets out of the neighborhood, I don't care because I know I'm helping the neighborhood. If you know what I'm saying, you know. So <laughs> I'm so fascinated, Gwen. I had no idea because I love your books. I had no idea you've written twelve of them, though. So Thank you. Yes, I want it's to pick... amazing to me too, really. I don't know how it's happened. <laughs> <laughs> Get a lot to say and a lot to share, you know. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite books I'm going to hold up, and this will show up later, but this I didn't realize this book is how old now? This that is your puppy be, book. That's the first book I ever wrote, and that will be 20 years old in August this year. So amazing, really. It, it is amazing and it, because it still carries uh, information that's true and uh, you, your newest book is called Super Puppy? Yes, the Super Pup. It's, that's more pictures. Yep. They made me run. It's more abbreviated. But this one, I think this one is still the best one. I wrote this one in my attic while I was still working for Blue Cross. And it was really all the things I wanted to tell people when they brought in dogs where, that had gone wrong. And I wanted to tell them for their next puppy. Um, and it was so obvious to me that if only they could do, everybody could do all these things that was in the book, they'd end up with a lovely dog. I, and it seemed so obvious that I wanted to tell everybody. And I, I wrote and wrote and wrote until I couldn't write any more. And then I sent it off to a publisher. And luckily, um, Hamlin published it and it went off from there. It's really fascinating, Gwen, um, that it's the simple things that we come, I want to say come natural for a lot of us in the field. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's uh, critical thinking, I guess you would call it, uh, making it simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. We, we, sometimes we make dog training so complicated. Yeah, I agree. I agree. In fact, I always tell my students, they say, who should we listen to? And I say, whoever makes it sound like common sense. They, oh, I love um, that. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah. The only thing is, it's not so common because not, not many people have that common sense. I am really. very lucky because I, I married a wonderful woman who was a student of mine 12 years ago. And so she has listened to me lecture and talk for, and work in, for 12 years. And so she brings me, she grounds me once in a while because I'll, get some, I'll become a little frustrated about something I'm seeing that's happening about a person, whether or not they're hearing my advice. And they say, you have to understand that they're not doing it because um, uh, for any bad reason, they just, to them, they, they, they don't make the connection, the same connection that I'm trying to share with them. That 
Uh, and, and just before the show today, a woman was outside the audience and she heard about the show and she started telling me about a Labrador, how she doesn't understand. She went to obedience school, but he's a bonehead. Well, that wasn't her word. That was my word. But the same idea. <laughs> and she said that it doesn't jump on counters at home, but it does at her mother's house. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I said, but have you taught it at the mother's, your mother's house not to jump on the counters? Or you just assume that the dog's going to know? She goes, I just thought it was universal. Once you taught a dog... They would know mm. everything all the time. And yeah. that's not the way it is, is it? No, and I think I think what happens is that if you grow up with dogs, and especially like I did, I spent more time with dogs than I did with people when I was small. And so things seem to me to be second nature. But actually, I learned them. Yes. And I learned them from the dogs. Um, and, I, and I get frustrated with people when they don't know the same thing. And I try to remember that actually they probably spent more time with people. And so they have better people skills than I do. <laughs> there you go. And to, to try and teach them. I think, I think you're right. So once I'm on that track, I'm okay. I think that our experience, like I started back in 1970. And so I've been doing this is my whole life uh, in one form or another. And I think working around zoo animals has taught me tremendous stuff because you can't use force to accomplish anything with these animals. You've mm -hmm. learned to become, um, um, it's an ugly word, but you learn to be a manipulator with yes. the animals. That's the only word that I can think of that, that might make sense to everybody who's listening, that you have to shape, you have to convince the animal it's their idea. Yeah, and yeah. You, and you can't do that with force. No. And I think, I think the whole world runs better if we use positive methods, whether it's with people, animals, yeah. whatever. You know, it's just, it's just a nicer, happier world. Everybody sort of feels better about, about being in it. Absolutely. So it, it just takes a bit of application, I think, and a bit of learning about the learning theory and that sort of thing. So um, it just takes a while to teach people. It's, it takes time and patience. I, t I tell yeah. people it takes time and patience to train a dog, but it takes time and patience for trainers to teach people. Yes, it a really does. We've been at it 20 years, George, and, and are we any further forward? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, I had a client, I, I, and this woman's wonderful, and I just love her dog to pieces, and it's her first dog, and it's a bad match. It wasn't, she got it from a, um, with the, we have a lot of rescue organizations that are bringing the dogs up from the southern part of the United States up to the northeast. And I, I, one of these days I'll do a show just on my thoughts about this, but I'm going to be careful right now. But I think they're playing the emotional card, and I don't think that's healthy because a lot of people are rescuing these animals thinking that they have to take them. And this was a bad match for this wonderful lady with this dog. Right off the bat, she knew it was a bad match, but she stuck with it. And, um, and she doesn't realize, Gwen, that She's always surprised when I say, I have to do my dog. She meets my dog and he thinks he's, he's perfect. And I said, well, mm -hmm. he, didn't, he didn't come to me this way. No. I, no. I had to shape him to be in, um, like I said, normally I love having the dogs in the studio with me, but when I'm doing Skype because this, the, the setup is different, it's difficult because the dogs are going to go over and stick their nose in the camera right in the middle of the show. <laughs> so, because they're not, they're, they're loose. They're really well behaved, but... They weren't. Mm. They didn't come that way. They mm. they they learn through sharing. Mm. I, want, I think I think it takes a year to get a dog up to speed, um, and really you should be giving it a huge amount of education in that first year. And I was reading. I don't very often read the reviews on Amazon, but I was just checking whether the Super Pup was available on Amazon um, last night in in America. And I read. I happened to get into reading the reviews, which you should never do. But one of them said, "Well, it's all very well. This book says everything about you know what you should do, and but it says you also have to be there all day. And I'm not there all day because I'm at work. Right. And there's no advice given for that. And but the trouble is, if you're going to raise a puppy well, you have to be there. In my opinion, you know, you can't really do it part time because you get a bit of a part-time dog, really, and sometimes he's good, sometimes he's not. Yeah. So better, really, if you can give him as much as you can or her as much as you can for a year, then he's trained and he's lovely and, and you can progress from there. I, I agree. I, I tell people it's, it's not always... We, we have to face the reality of the world, so it's, not the, um, it's the quality of time that when you're with him that he's getting the most that he can from you or she. The puppy yes. is getting the best. You need to commit. Put your, I tell people, put your cell phone down when you're walking your dog. 
Yeah. Put your yeah. cell phone down. Take it, you know, go out and play with your dog and teach the dog why you play because that's what play learning actually is is yes. is is incorporate play into it and the dogs learn so much happier. Yeah, so. you can't really be an absent parent any yes. more than you can with children. Yes. But at least it's a shorter time for dogs, whereas you have to commit 20 years to <laughs> raising a human. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, when you, your puppy program right now is called Puppy School. And you're, yes. tra you're training other people now to become, do I understand that you're, are you training other people to become puppy trainers? That's right. I, I did. I wrote the perfect puppy and tried to get the information out to everybody in that way. And then, after working for twelve years in rescue, you get to the point where you had enough of firefighting and you want to do some preventative work. So yeah. I knew puppy, puppy wasn't enough. You know, you actually need to show people the handling skills and the physical skills they need. Um, so I was running puppy classes. I've been running puppy classes for years, um, and I thought, well, so it would be so much better if there were more of us teaching you know so I started um puppy school I left left Blue Cross and started puppy school and 12 years ago it, it was a franchise operation just a small part-time franchise operation where they come and they learn from me and then um they pay a little bit of their fees to keep puppy school going and and then we can and so what so what we do is we train them initially they have to have quite a bit of um of practical experience already to train and they come and train with us, and then we give them behavior lessons um, every oh, yeah. two, twice a year, so that they really upskill themselves um, and keep learning about behavior as they go on. Um, and actually, last week, um, 12 of us spent a whole week training shelter dogs. Oh, and is that right? Them, yeah, we had a lovely time. Um, Did you do this? Well, our local shelter it was a really nice shelter, and nice facility, um, lovely people. We took 12 of their dogs and we put them through the um, Kennel Club Good Citizens Award Scheme. Oh, wonderful. And we got five through bronze and three through silver. So we were really proud of that. Oh, that's it's, fantastic. Yeah. It's really I, good fun. I think that um, um, when people ask me how I got started, I, I started because I used to... Um, well, how I got started rehabilitating dogs was way back in the 70s. And the way I did it was I, I borderline getting into trouble, if I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I used to, I used to death, sign the dog's death certificate and take them home with me to rehabilitate oh. them. <laughs> I, think the, um, the, I think the time thing is, is, is expired, so I don't know if they can come after me for something <laughs> like this. But, um, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, um, it was a research facility. Oh, and, really? Yeah, really? that's how I got started. And I won't give the name, but uh, anybody yeah. who does their homework on me can figure it out pretty quick. <laughs> and I used to take work for surgical research department with dogs. Okay. And um, there was many dogs. And these were the days when dogs were brought in from pounds. The old days mm -hmm. when, before we knew mm -hmm. humane societies, they were brought in from dog pounds. Yeah. And there was a percentage yeah. that was required to give to the government to go into research. Um, and so I got started right off the bat in 1970. I was a young man. Mm. And, um, and I see these dogs and I said, this is somebody's pet. We got to get this dog out of here. And that's how I, I got started rehabilitating animals. Oh, fantastic. And I didn't know that. That's amazing. Uh, Oops, I lost you. So much from that. Don't... I lost you. Can you say that again? You skipped. We lost you. Sorry. Sorry. You just learn so much from that, don't you? From oh. taking dogs home and and rehabilitating them yourself, that hands-on, hands so on. good for, for learning. Mm. And, and, and when people ask, how'd you get started? I mean, what does that have to do, you know, what makes you different about working with the puppies compared to maybe other people? And I say, well, I, I, I can't tell you about the way the other people train, but um, when you deal with behavior issues for a living, you learn ways to prevent them from getting started. And the prevention is the key. It is, yeah, I agree. I agree. If we could, if we could catch hold of all those people that have puppies when they're so enthusiastic and so keen, yes. then we could make it okay. You know, we we wouldn't have to have dogs going into rescue for issues. Um, and that was always my ideal, really. And and that's what I've been working towards for the last twelve years. Um, and we now have seventy tutors around the UK. Um, quite a few people. People have come from the, from abroad as well, you know, from when I go to, to do lectures in different countries and they say, oh, we'd really like to do your puppy program and then they come over and, um, and do the puppy course with us. 
So, uh, so we've now got little branches in Iceland. There's one and Estonia. Really? <laughs> yeah, That's Italy, wonderful. All different places around the world. Do you so. do um, do you do uh, workshops or seminars where you introduce um, trainers? Do you go places to introduce people to your idea and show them how they get started? You know, with puppies. Um, well, I, I have done that. Yeah, I have yeah. done that in the past. Um, it, it takes quite a lot of time to do the whole puppy course. It's a week's right. course with right. the right kind of people because you have to have the skills in place with people before I can teach them. Because obviously teaching teaching puppies and teaching their owners is actually quite a skilled business, as you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to have quite a level of competence before I can I can put them on the program. I, I hear you. Um, yeah, but once once we've done it, um, they go out and then they are on their own for six months um, or sometimes three months, depending on, on what their level is like. And then we go out and we make sure that they're doing all right and, and just um, visit and make sure they can have a bit of input just to make them a bit better. Um, and then we get everyone together every now and again and, and teach them different things on behavior. We just had it yesterday. We had a, a course on tag teach um, from the Karen Pryor Academy Tag teach. People. What's so, tag teach? Tag teach is um is getting your message across to owners. So it's it's getting your message across. Um, so it's it's breaking down training into very simple stages, um, and not giving more than five words as an instruction, which is very hard for me. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It actually really concentrates the mind and stops you waffling, which is very useful. So What a great so, program. I like that. Yeah. It's, it's good. Karen Pryor, obviously, with um, with her clicker training stuff. She's very good. So um, so we try and we try and feed in courses like that uh, whenever we can um, so that all our, our tutors are as skilled as they possibly can be and, and as knowledgeable and up to date. Um, so we're always doing things like that, which makes it a lot of fun. So I'm going to set you up here for a second. So be, be heads up, would you say, because I'm <laughs> going to set you up here. Um, I'm a member of a wonderful organization called the National Association of Dog Obedience Instructors here in the United States. We're yes. celebrating 50 years old this year. Wow. I'm going to be That's heading out to Oklahoma. I'm so psyched about going to Oklahoma and, and being part of the 50th anniversary. Um, there's some wonderful trainers in that organization. I would, I, I, I try to explain to people when they call me and I say, well, you can do a private with me or you can do, do group classes. I don't do group anymore. I'm thinking about going back and doing puppy programs again. But I tell them and correct me. And don't be afraid to correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, that's what this is all about. It's a learning for all of us. Um, yeah. I, I, I try to explain to people, if you're going to go to a, 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 a facility for puppy program, it should be the top trainer teaching the puppy class. Mm -hmm. It should be the one with the most education and the more years experience on dealing with a variety of behaviors and so on. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. Um, but living in the real world, I know what kind of puppy training is available in the UK, for example, um, and it's not always the best trainers. Yes. And often... It's terrible trainers. And so even though I take quite a lot of young women, because it's mostly women that apply, sadly, right. just very, very few nice men in dog training. <laughs> so Thank you very much. I in, think that was a compliment, <laughs> whether it was meant that way or not. <laughs> <laughs> it it was. But it's, you know, it is. It, it, now we've got more positive. There seems to be more women interested. Um, so we get a lot of young women. And a lot of them haven't had masses of experience. Um, in teaching people but as long as they've got the the um the background with the the dog you know on a one-to-one -one basis we can teach them um and then they the program we have is enough for them to go out and start really positive classes and quite quickly they learn enough to do a really really good job so i do agree with you that it has to be the best people but as long as you've got a good system of training then you can get them skilled enough to do a good job quite quickly brilliant so here's a setup i want you yeah. to come to maine i want <laughs> to put on and invite all as many dog trainers so we can get from the nato organization this directed to you guys i'm going to make sure i put this on nato's uh, facebook page in in the website so guys better listen up i would love for you to come and offer a program even if it's a weekend thing if you could put yeah. a a workshop together for experienced dog trainers. These are brilliant yeah. people. They've all accomplished, not, I sh let me rephrase that. Many of them have accomplished 
tremendous amount of success with their own writings and so on and so forth. And um, I would love to have another gathering instead of just meeting once a year and, and have a nice refresher because you don't get a lot of refresher for just puppies. There's a lot of refreshers on a variety of behavior issues, but a nice refresher that we, things that we take for granted with our yeah. puppies. I think that would love for you to come to um, New England and, um, and offer a, a workshop. And I have a beautiful facility for that. So, <laughs> okay. That's my well, setup. You get the with very experienced people, but I think you can always learn from each other, can't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yeah. It's. I think it's really important that you know, even though that would be very daunting, there would be a lot of simple things I probably could could bring out again. You know, that maybe people have forgotten, or you know, just just little things. I think when when you're very experienced, it's only little things you learn, isn't it, from every speaker that you go to. But as long as you learn something, and I think the most important thing is to have live puppies there, so that we're well, not live Absolutely. puppies. <laughs> you know, yeah, as opposed to stuffed puppies. <laughs> as opposed to stuffed puppies. But like you know, real, real, real live animals, because I think they're the ones who teach us so much. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. So, so as long as there's live puppies, I'm, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having too much. I, I, I want to keep you on for a long time. Uh, <laughs> this conversation, <laughs> because I, I want to touch on something that I get asked a lot and I know you do and so if I say it people are here are just going to hear me say this again and again and again so I'm going to pose a question to you that I get asked all the time yes I like I want to I, I'm, I agree I want to use food to train my puppy but I don't want to use food for the rest of my life uh, yeah <laughs> that's a very common one yeah um, yeah. yeah so yeah. so I would say to that well you know do you work for no money do you, do you, are you happy to work for no wages? Would you come and work for me for no wages? Because if you would, then I'd be very pleased to have you. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and, because that, and that starts them thinking, I think, about the fact that they wouldn't do something for nothing, so why should the puppy? Um, and is praise enough? You know, is praise enough to get a puppy to really concentrate on learning? Learning's hard. If you think back to school and how difficult it was and how frustrating it was when you didn't know the answer and you had to work oh through boy. it to get it right. You know, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard. Learning's hard. So there has to be a motivation. Is praise enough? Can you get praise all the time? Probably, you know, because you're always loving him and giving him fuss. So that's probably not going to be a really good incentive. So something has to be an incentive. And the other real good incentives for puppies are play and food. Um, and if we start with that and, and get them through the learning so they know the cues, then you can start reducing the food right. and the, the incentives. And, and you can start then thinking, well, I might give one incentive for two um, two ideas, you know, two, two performances rather than one and, and steadily start extending how many you give until you realize you're not giving it enough and they're not responding anymore <laughs> so right, you have to right. bring it back to a reasonable level you so, do you ever, I do you, i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you um, um do you find that i have a dog that um who's now four years old and i still use food on occasion yeah but yeah. i have to be careful because it becomes almost a distraction yes i agree especially if you've got a labrador or you're using hot sausage you know that might be too much yeah. for him you can't concentrate because it's so ex Stutting that you yeah. can't think. Yeah. Um, you know, if you offer me chocolate, you know, I'm there and ready. Um, <laughs> I'm listening, you know, and, and can't, can't think about anything other than, you know, what I want. But yeah. if it's a lesser reward, then it's easier to concentrate. So I think it's always, it's that's one of the most difficult things, I think, getting the right reward at the right time and in the right quantity. I think that's a very difficult thing for owners to be intuitive about. It takes a while for them to learn that. Yeah, and I noticed that... Um, um, one of the most difficult things I have, and and I, and so I have to question not whether I'm presenting it properly. I use value system. I use a high value, moderate value, low value food. Same yeah. thing with toys. High value, low value. I use the high to teach, and then moderate to maintain, and then the low to kind of just have fun with it, uh, yeah. if you will. Um, we and, call it we call it a hierarchy of rewards in our classes. We call it a hierarchy of rewards rewards in our oh, the hierarchy, hierarchy. Yeah, okay hierarchy. um yeah. yeah exactly and and 
But then I find that uh, after I won't see somebody for a while, they'll call me back because they said, well, I'm still having trouble because I'm still using food. In other words, they never moved away. Uh, yeah. They yeah. Because even though they, they're probably making the progress, they find themselves going back again and counting on the food as more of a bribe anymore. It transfers. Yeah. So can you talk about your opinion of the difference between luring and bribing? Ah, that's a good one, actually. That is a good one. Um, I think luring is purely and simply for getting the action you want. So a sit is an obvious one or a down is an obvious one. Food on puppy's nose and lure him into a down and he goes down. As soon as he's down, his elbows hit the floor, then you feed the food. Right. Um, so that's a lure in my opinion. Bribing is not what you want to do. So that is... The, pu the puppy won't come in through the door. Perhaps it's been squashed in the door or the door is slammed and it's worried. So you hold out the food, he comes towards you and you move it back a bit. Yes. And he says, oh, I don't really, I don't know whether I want to come through the door because I'm still scared of the door. Is the food enough? And if it's a big enough bribe, he might come through. Like if you offered me £100 to come to your, do your NADOI seminar, then I might come. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'll talk to him about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty cheap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I meant a thousand. I did. There you go. <laughs> you so, just said yourself, I get a little recorded here. You're 100 pounds, you're going to come and do a NATO <laughs> program for us. I love it. Anyhow. <laughs> yeah, but it's the same principle, you know. Uh, you have to have an incentive to overcome the fear. So right. a bribe would be to say, you know, if I give you, if I offer you this much, will you come forward? And, and the puppy comes forward because he's got a bribe. And has he learned anything from that? Well, not really. You know, it wasn't a great way of learning. So bribes, I don't think, are very useful at all. What is useful is reward for doing the right thing. And yeah. if the puppy learns that if he gets the reward for doing, uh, there's, there's a, a reward on offer somewhere um, for responding to cues, which is part of his education. I think um, when you first start, they have no clue, whether it's a puppy or an adult dog, untrained, they have no clue that there's rewards on offer. Right. But once you educating them they realize that if you do certain things for this person you're going to get a reward and then they start working out or trying to work out how to get those rewards and then the reward becomes a reward and not a bribe and you don't even have to have it in view you the, the dog knows that it's coming there you go that's, that's when we really know you're making success when you in and, and, and that's the hardest to, to explain to somebody that, no, don't, stop reaching into your pocket because now your part, reaching into your pocket is the cue to the dog to come. Because they're, ma right. they're making that, before it was down by their nose, now they're waiting for you to reach in your, and you say, you'll say to the dog, or you sit as an example because that's the easiest example to, you'll say sit, and the dog will look at you, you reach in your pocket and the dog sits. Well, now that's the cue to sit and yeah. not waiting until the dog sits and so on. Yeah, it's... Yeah. It's so much fun. I love working. So many cases I see are heartbreaking. I see them, unfortunately, too late. You know, I see them when I'm doing the best I can I don't, uh, to, to save a dog's life and uh, it's bitten somebody or, and that's how we get a chance to meet Don, the gentleman you met earlier before the show started. Um, uh, many, many bite cases. Uh, dangerous dogs are just dogs with not proper upbringing, not knowing how to cope. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to teach an older dog, you can get there, but it's so much more work. It's so, so much more work. Oh my <laughs> gosh, it just, and it may yes. take a year, there's a year again to yeah. get total success. And, um, and I night, took, go ahead. Sorry, I had a dog called Bo who was a Labrador fine runner, and he was a beautiful dog. I got him 18 months old. He, he'd bitten 10 people, and oh he was my aggressive. God. He was aggressive to people and dogs. It took me two years to get him over his fear and his aggression towards people and two years to get him over his aggression and fear towards dogs. So that's four, four years. And we both know that if we'd have got him as a puppy, he would never have done it. We could have spent two or three months on him. He'd never have done it. Yeah. And it's such a waste of time, isn't it? It's so frustrating. I'm going to admit, on TV and to you, especially somebody who I admire so much for the work that you do, I messed up my boy. I oh. made, the, and I know better, and I am just devastated by it that um, I, I decided to get into a sport with working dogs, and I was convinced by somebody, it's mm -hmm. my fault, 
I, I didn't do critical thinking that your dog, working dogs, can't play with other dogs. So I didn't yeah. socialize him the way I tell people to mm -hmm. do it all the time. Yeah. So as he was growing up, and he still was coping really well, but as he was growing up and he became to more of a, a juvenile stage, whenever we went back to the breeders for an event, it was a breed thing, all mm -hmm. the big boys wanted to kick his tush because mm -hmm. he, was a, he had a, a lot of presence about him. That's and he cute, would walk yeah. in and the other dogs would say, oh, we got to straighten this little boy out. Yeah. And, what but, is oh, my gosh. And I'm so, so, and by 13 months of age, he says, okay, you know what? I'm not going to take this anymore. Yeah, We've worked yeah. at it and so on, and I'm there. But the point is, is I didn't have to be. No. Well, I think that's really brave to admit that because – a lot of trainers won't do that. You know, they'll have the dog quietly put to sleep or, you know, they'll keep it out the bag, but they won't actually say it. And I think it's the easiest thing in the world to mess up a puppy, you oh. know, even with a lot of knowledge. You just, you know, there's things. And also, I think it's really hard to see when your own dog is in trouble. Or you can see it, but you can't fix it. I found myself, when I had um, Spider, when I was raising my lovely boy, um, I found myself reading my own book. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to get in the end I went to the best person I knew who was a good behaviorist and they helped me out. But I think it's you're so emotionally attached that you can't really do it yourself. Sometimes so you're too close, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're too close. There's no shame in admitting it. Yeah. And you just have to find someone that can help you out that will do it positively. Yeah. We never get to the point where it was awful. I just felt bad because I cheated him. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, it, it, sure. Never to the point where it was a danger or anything, but it's just it's not the way I raised all my other dogs. And I, uh, and I finally looked at my training director at, at the club and I said, um, I'm going back to, I'm, not, I'm tired of doing this. I'm training him the way I've always trained all my dogs. If I get my ribbons, great. If I don't, so what? I don't yeah, care. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and yeah, we get off a little bit, but I wanted to talk that, I want people to understand that, that folks, it's, it's, you know, everybody expects dog trainers to have the perfect dog. You, you, it depends on when you get the dog and so on and so forth. And sometimes things in your life kind of alter. It's okay. If you made mistakes, you didn't get your puppy started early enough. You can, it's never too late. The idea is still go back and, and help the young dog or the older dog start over again. They're never too old to, to learn. Um, when my wife and I got married, she had a nine-year-old chow. And she was convinced that the dog was um, dog aggressive. She was convinced. She, when we first started dating, she, she even said to me, she said, how am I going to get, you know, how's this going to work? It's going to be a deal break. I got a dog that can't get along. And he's going to move in with these other dogs. Um, it took 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to, and, and she was actually fine. But she had in her vision. She was afraid the dog was going to be there. And sometimes we create those problems. Yeah. Um, when we feel them, we, we actually create problems that don't exist. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. It's um, good to have good behaviorists around to go and ask. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she was lucky. Oh, good students. I've learned so much students, from my students, yeah. you know? Um, uh, so, anyhow. The, as we sit here, I can think of case after case, especially bribing. I'm working with a case right now, and the dog will get up to a door, and first thing you do is um, uh, we taught you have a toy, and that, be, that, that becomes your toy. All right? The only time the puppy ever sees it is when... It's with you. It's a special toy the dog really adores seeing because it, it, whenever you pull it out, it knows it's going to do something with you. And it keeps that engagement really tight. And, uh, and this guy is so much fun to work with. And, uh, and the dog is just marvelous to watch grow. It's a puppy. And, um, and he'll get to a doorway and he'll toss the ball into the door thinking the dog's going to chase it through the door. And he says, no, no, you just disengaged. You threw the toy and now the dog's still stuck in the door. And what are you going to do? So yeah. I said, we need the food. And so he did exactly. And this happens to a lot of people. They put the food by the dog's nose and the dog comes forward. And I, I want them to give the dog a treat for coming forward that one step. Now get the dog to do a couple more. And they would pull the dog, the food away. And so mm -hmm. now the dog's standing at the threshold of the door and the food now, every time it takes a step, <laughs> instead of getting it, they move it again, you know? Yeah. It's like that vision of, um, you know, I don't see this vision anymore, but you used to, when we were young, you used to see the, the um, guy riding a donkey with a stick with a carrot hanging down in front of the donkey. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now that's a bribe. <laughs> <laughs> 
so <laughs> animals are very, very stupid and dogs are not very stupid <laughs> no I, i'd like to touch one more thing before we have to wrap up because i don't want to <laughs> but i want to talk to you about how you teach uh and your your clients and your instructors who are working with people how do you teach bite inhibition well that's a really good one you see i don't think you need to and i know this flies in the face of all all people that say you should do but i think dogs know or quite quickly learn how to use their mouths yeah. in the same way as we learn how to use our hands and really you're never going to stop a dog that's an extremist from biting. So if he's just been run over in an accident and he's not thinking clearly and you try and pick him up off the road, yes. he's probably going to bite you. Right. And, and no amount of bite inhibition is going to stop him trying to save his own life. So I think from that perspective, we don't need it. Um, when it comes to just everyday biting, I think it's really important to put puppy biting onto toys as soon as you can so they never learn to bite human skin. And they never learn to put their mouths on you. Why would you want to teach them to put their mouths on you and, and hold gently? Because yes. if they're always focused on toys, they don't ever need to bite you. Yes. So, truthfully, I don't think you need to teach bite inhibition. I think you just need to teach them to focus on toys. And then when they're excited, in their most excited moments, um, they're going to be looking around for objects to bite, not people. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and, and also we overstimulate a puppy to bite us harder because I've seen people with cuts on their arms and their legs. And, yeah. and it's because then they're either overstimulating the puppy, in other words, a puppy's up on the couch, this one gentleman is scratching his puppy and then overstimulates. And next thing you know, the mouse starts, puppy starts biting on his, on his finger. And next thing you know, he's biting on his hands. And it's a yeah. couch. If you want your puppy on your couch, it's your choice. It's not my decision. But it should be quiet time, not play time. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. And and have something you can put in the puppy's mouth like a teether so that they chew on that instead of on you. And while it's um, next to you, yes. My, yeah, my wife I and I have these discussions all the time, and she looked at me the other day when we were working with this new puppy, and she said, I don't understand, and I've watched you train for so many years, but I don't understand why are people having so much trouble with bite ambition? We've never had to do anything fancy to our dogs to stop the puppy from biting us. And, mm -hmm. and the answer is exactly what you said. They have toys. They learn to bite on toys, not on my clothing. But I yeah. don't trade. Yeah. I, I think the other th the big, big problem for a lot of novice owners is they're really rubbish at toy play. Yeah. So you get this yes. puppy from litter and he's used to biting on other puppies and you present this toy and they say, oh, I don't really want that. I don't understand what to do with it. I want to bite you because you're moving and you're soft. Right. Um, and so we have to teach people. I think one of our biggest jobs as puppy trainers is to teach them how to play properly and successfully so they both enjoy it. Um, with big soft toys that you can put in the puppy's mouth and, and wriggle it. And sometimes you let it go because people can be really possessive of yeah. it. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you throw it, sometimes you wriggle it around a post and it disappears and puppy's really interested. So teaching them how to play successfully, I think, is a really important lesson. Once they can do that, the puppy says, ah, I get it. I don't bite people. I bite those big fluffy things. And then they're happy. They're satisfied. They don't need to bite you. Absolutely. I agree with you so much on that because um, um, I have a video I was hoping to be able to play for the show, and I'll make sure I'll email it to you if you haven't seen it. It's um, a video I've made of my Bouvier when he was young, and it's called yeah. Play Observation. And mm -hmm. I just took it with my phone. And he was running around in the snow, and he's chasing a toy in circles, just spinning, spinning, mm -hmm. spinning. And, if you, and you'll hear me call the puppy back to him, and he'll stop and look, and then he'll grab the toy, and then he'll call him again. He'll stop. And unfortunately, I cut it just before he took off. And the next scene is him in the kitchen doing the same thing with another toy sliding. And then, and then the mm -hmm. next scene is... He's in the training room with me biting a tug toy. Yeah. And yeah. that's, there's in other words, it's toy associated. It might be me, but I'm going to play with the toy and that's the toy's moving. And mm -hmm. that stimulates the, the bite and he's never bit my hands. Yeah. And this yeah. is my big Absolutely. male bouvier. Yeah. So they don't, if they don't learn to bite on you, why would they do it later? Right. You know, it doesn't occur to them, I think. It's the same as, I always say, if you don't want a dog to jump on your kitchen surfaces, don't allow him 
ever to do it for the first year. And after the first year, he's not going to suddenly invent this behavior of jumping on the surfaces. You know, they just don't do it. So if they never do it for a whole year, the the first year of their lives, they're not going to do that behavior later. So let's do that with biting as well as everything else. And that's an easy one because it's easy to forget. And and, and I'm going to create a scenario for the folks at home that uh, this is what I picture when we talk about this topic that we just had about jumping on counters. What do you call them? Kitchen services? Is that what you call them? Surface. Surface, okay. Um, uh, and that is, you're <laughs> paying the dog's food, the puppy comes over, puts his feet up on the counter, and you talk to it. Mm. Step one for teaching a dog to jump up on the counter. <laughs> mm. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, we'll have to edit that, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyhow, you're, you're fixing food, the puppy comes over, jumps up on your legs, or jumps up on the counter, watching you fix the food, and then you give it something to eat. Well, there's your start for teaching the puppy to, that it's okay to j- jump on counter surfaces later. I also, um, and I'm going to you, tell you what I do and have a little feedback, and um, I want my students to understand that we, we share. Trainers, good trainers share with each other and not afraid to expose what we do in order to um, yeah. make it better or, or alter things. So, and because I know many times I'll ask my students questions and they're afraid to answer. Like it might be the wrong answer. No, this, let's find out. It's, mm. Whether it's right or wrong, it's, it's what's the effect from it. I don't see them as right or wrong. I see it as what's the puppy learning from what you're teaching. And it making sense? There's, there's so much to learn, I think, about dogs. Yeah. There's so much to learn. And we're still just on the tip of the iceberg, really, because we're only 20 years down the road of positive training. So we should be sharing and we should be kind of making sure that we know the best one, best thing to, to do out there. And, you know, so the more we listen, the more we'll find out. But I think I still do think that the best teachers are the dogs themselves. Absolutely. The more work you do with the dogs, the more you learn. So. I've been very lucky because my dad was killed when I was 12 years old. But before he died, um, I watched the way he interacted with our family dog. And that's what taught me about positive training way back in the 50s. The interaction he had with this dog was pure um, uh, Clarence. This dog was uh, a movie dog. This dog did stuff that nobody would believe if I told the stories. The only reason I have proof is that he's made the newspaper several times. Mm. Uh, Mm. His tactics, the things that he did as a pup, as a young dog, as a family dog. So he wasn't a super dog, and he he looked very much like an English shepherd. Mm. But I doubt very much, we grew up poor, so I doubt very much we had an English Shepherd. But mm. he had that same characteristic, the same features and so on. So I was lucky because I was raised with a family who never yelled and screamed at the dog. The dog knew, you know, to not come by, when you sit at the table, you're going to go lay on your bed over the corner. And mm. it wasn't done through harshness. And that's the way I was raised. Mm. So I've known, I know no other technique. Mm. Um, but I, there is, there is, we can make it simple. It doesn't have to be wicked complicated. Just like you said, the first year is so critical. I tell people even the first four months is really, really important as well to, to yeah. shape the puppy before um, the del teeth, before they start getting into trouble. Uh, oftentimes I meet people with, and you, you, you can correct me if you see this as being off a little bit. Um, and um, if I see a dog that's uh, biting at a year and a half of age, I start, when did it start? They say, oh, and he started recently. I said, no, let's look back to around five or six, seven months of age. That's when yeah. it really, really starts, doesn't it? Yes, it does indeed, yeah. And I, just, I quite agree. I think we, we have a cutoff time for our puppy classes at 20 weeks. Um, 20 weeks, okay. So 20 to start yeah. with, yeah. Huh? So, so we're taking them pre-pubescence because it's so much easier. And if you can put all the foundation of training and handling and socialization in before puberty hits right. then you've kind of got them for life and you don't have to go through adolescence struggling so hard so um yeah. so that's so yeah i quite agree the earlier you can get the information into owners and puppies the better well i could stay here with you for the rest of the day but we um it's getting on with time and folks uh, you want to remember that they're with us for a very short time they come to us as puppies if we're lucky. We may get them as older dogs, but if you back them up with the training, just like it was a fresh puppy coming into your home, it'll sure make it a lot easier for the dog to learn a new life with you. So if you adopt a dog at three, four, five years old, don't be afraid to go back and reteach it like it's a puppy. Just because it knows some things, it's, I still, I'm 64 years old and I still read. 
And I want to keep reading. I want to keep learning. And the day I stop learning is the day that I put me away. And, and, and your dogs are the same way. Keep them stimulated. Keep them happy. The, the more you stimulate them, you'll see that they'll, they live nice, long, healthy loves, uh, loves, healthy lives. Sorry. Uh, but it's done through love as well. And so remember, they're with us for a short time. Give them the best life that they can get. You're part of their life. We took them into a home. Make them part of our life and give back to them. Because, folks... At the end of the day, it's all about the dogs. Thanks for joining us, and thank you, Gwen, very much for taking time from your busy schedule. Thank you.